Hanuma va Agroyan. Asof Beche. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Gary. I work with the United Nations in the Islamic Republic of Iran. And before we get into the meat of this afternoon's, uh, what I hope will be a conversation, I would like to, to try to answer as, uh, one of the points that Yar um, Batman Gelij mentioned this morning, or, or an issue that he raised. I don't know if Yar is in the, in the house. I hope Bobby is. Um, they were asking, in the current context of all that swirling around us politically, does it make sense to have an event like this one? I believe the answer is yes, for a number of reasons. Um, the first is that we need, essentially, to be proactive and not reactive. And the second and ultimately the de defining one, given all that you've heard today, is this. Do we want to be on the right side of history? There's so much potential in this amazing country that I have had with my wife, um, Elizabeth, the privilege of living in for four and a half years, that I that I, I, I'm, I'm humbled to be here today to talk with you, share some thoughts about how much can be done, not just by civil society, and not just by, by government, but by the corporate community. Now, the original slide, um, which has disappeared somewhere, but in your, um, in your agendas, uh, you will see that I'm supposed to be here talking about, about corporate social responsibility. That was what uh, Bobby and Yara and I agreed I would talk about um, a couple of weeks ago. But as I, as I studied the profile of, of uh, you good people, and as I looked at the extent and nature and pattern of the challenge we face, I decided to shift it around to talk about three things. People, planet, and prosperity. And that's what I'd like to share with you today. I'll talk a little bit about corporate social responsibility at some point, but it's not going to be the main thing. The main thing is for me to try to encourage you, especially you in the business community, to align your thoughts and visions, not just as citizens, not just as parents, but as profit-seeking businessmen and women with an idea that I believe will come, I certainly hope, it will come to define our generation. And I'll come to that idea as well in a minute or two. But I'd like to set the context a little bit. I'm not going to talk to you about business deals and exchange rates and, 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 and interest rates and investment. I'd like to give you a sense of what I think is the biggest challenge we face right now on this planet. It's extremism. We, we deal with that. We see extremism every day on the television in terms of um, one set of people shooting another set of people, explosions, it, it improvised explosive devices, and uh, the violence that our incredible creativity and imagination um, can bring to bear on others. That's one form of extremism, but there's a, a deeper, more lethal form of extremism at play. And that is the extremism of the way in which we treat this home of ours, planet Earth. You're thinking, okay, so this is the UN guy and he's gonna talk about uh, kumbaya and holding hands and what does this have to do with, with me and my business? Well, I hope to be able to show you that. For the se uh, about 72 years ago when the UN came into being, we had four goals, four primary objectives. The first, peace. Second, human rights. Third, Justice, and the fourth, sustainable growth. We talked about better standards of living in larger freedom. That was the language in those days. Now we talk about sustainable growth. You can look back over those 72 years and say, well, we as a community, and certainly we as the United Nations, have not performed particularly well. Well, we could debate that. You can also ask the question, what would have happened if the organization I've been privileged to work for for 30 years had not existed? Another debatable point. Fact is that right now, 
We, all 7.2 billion of us on this planet, are doing some pretty lethal damage to the only home that we have. When you look at the three main dimensions of the way we consume, energy, food, and water, different organizations more or less conclude that we will need between the year 2010 and 2030, okay, just 20 years, we will need 50% more energy to sustain the, the lifestyle that we have and that more people are entering into a middle class where they're consuming more per capita. We will need 50% more food. We will need 30% more water. That's a pretty tall ask. Before I share with you a more apocalyptic vision. Don't worry, towards the end I can talk about how we can, how we can fix this together. But the apocalyptic vision comes to me pretty powerfully. <coughs> I was born and raised in a tiny little island in the Caribbean called Barbados. And recently, you will have seen on television the, the, the violence that was visited upon our region by, by storms of unimaginable ferocity. You would have seen it connected to Florida, Texas, Puerto Rico, U.S. Virgin Islands, and British Virgin Islands. What you don't often see is a tiny little island just about 200 miles northwest of, of, of my island called Dominica. 73,000 people live on that island. It was absolutely and utterly devastated by Maria. Not a single person living on that island escaped. Not a single dwelling. It didn't get much coverage because the, the mainstream media looked at things connected to a metropolitan country, shall we say. But I have never seen anything like that before. And I have lived through many hurricanes in, in our island. That's just one. Storms. Floods. Warming. More vapor in the air. Kicking off warmer sea temperatures as well kicking off hurricanes, uh, storms, cyclones, typhoons, before you get to other aspects of what our consumption pattern is delivering on the planet. Droughts, heat waves, acidifying oceans, snowmelt. All of these things that are actually leaving, leading, in some cases, to sea level rise that is hitting coastal areas. The, 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 the droughts and the floods and so forth hitting agricultural productivity. Now, what happens with all of that? is that it makes people calculate whether they should stay in one place or not. If they move, what happens then? If they move, they become vulnerable. If they compete for resources, and resources become scarce, what happens then? What happens then to the institutions of governance? Collapse? Violence? Violent conflict? These are the things that I see happening in the future. And I see... Um, a, lot of, uh, a, a lot of dark shadows ahead of us. But we are sufficiently smart as a species to be able to anticipate these, these patterns and trends and try to outmaneuver them, to adapt and to mitigate for them. Now, brings me to what we're talking about uh, today. We have come up with a plan. And again, I say I've been in the UN for, sorry for the bad body language, walking in front of you. Um, it's a technique that I learned actually in the Islamic Republic of Iran with a, a long and distinguished history of, of, of culture and civilization, Bibakshi. Um, so we have not sat down and just looked at all these things happening and said, you know, well, we can't do anything about it. We, as a species, have actually managed through our intergovernmental processes to come up with a plan. It's a good plan. It moves us to Paris, yes, but it moves us beyond that. It moves us to this. Maybe not that, but maybe this. This is the only slide that I will have in this presentation, which I hope you will indulge me uh, for, uh, for 15 minutes, after which I've been uh, in invited to take uh, questions uh, from from you kind people. Um, we are now at, is that how much time is left or how much time I've... No, it's theoretical. And then it goes to my Whoa. <laughs> it's, it's terrifying. <laughs> it's a very benign welcoming area. 
Mm. I feel the love. <laughs> okay. It's funny I said, don't worry, can extend it a little bit. Okay. okay. All right. <coughs> per perhaps not till midnight, but. Yeah. So, well, you've admitted it now. <laughs> um, things that matter, I think, in an ultimate way, are up on that board. And some people have said, well, you had eight Millennium Development Goals, why do you need 17? You know, the UN as usual, why have, um, why have uh, eight when 17 will do? Um, I've looked at this again, 30 years in the UN, believing very much in the flag. I can't come up with a better set, to be honest. And I'm frankly quite amazed that back at the end of uh, 2015, in fact, in September, the countries of the planet agreed to this. They're all there. No poverty number one, um, food for everyone, number two, ed uh, health, education, three, four, gender equality, not empowerment only, equality, sanitation and health, number six, energy efficiency, seven, eight, decent jobs, nine, innovation, industrialization, ten, balancing consumption um, and justice between and among nations. I know you're reading this, at least those of you in the, in the front rows behind me. I'm not. I'm mem I've memorized it. I think they're really important. I could go on for the remaining, uh, all, the, all, the, all the environment ones, from 11 to 15, then 16, um, inclusive societies, uh, accountable government, and 17 partnerships. It's important to, to have this as a vision for us as a citizen, as, as, as governments, and, 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 and I think you guys too. In the, in the private sector. The, the fact of the matter is, is that from what I have seen, you do actually agree with this. We had Iran Paul uh, this morning talking to us, a lot of slides, very impactful presentation. One of the questions that was on that poll was not actually uh, mentioned, which I, which I was surprised by and a little deflated by. And that question was to all of the people that, that, that took the survey, Protecting the environment should be given priority even if the economy suffers to some extent was the, was the, was the issue being posed. Almost 60% of you and those who are not here but who participated in this survey said, yeah, we can take a little bit of an economic hit because we think the environment's more important. Only 30% said the reverse and uh, the, re the remainder were, were undecided. That tells me that as, as, as parents, as citizens, and as businessmen and women, you think this is important. Now, I could talk about corporate social responsibility and why while you're making your millions and billions, you should uh, devote a little bit of that to the, um, to, to the community, the people who, upon whose labor you, you rely and in whose environment you are operating. Mining company, gas company, whatever. But I would like to try to convince you, using just four of these on the, on the wall, on the board behind me on the screen, um, why you should be aligning your corporate decisions with, with, with these goals, that they apply to you as well as businessmen and women. Take number four, education. Decent education. Does it matter that a government, uh, that a country like Iran, with an educated, tech-savvy, hyper-connected bunch of young people already in their 20s, millennium generation, and growing up, are likely to be looking for digital education, are likely to be looking for things that connect to artificial intelligence, augmented and virtual reality, digital, um, digital uh, school systems, is that, does it make sense for you to be thinking about investing in those areas that the government and the private sector will also be looking to channel money? That's number four. Let's look at number five. Gender equality. Equality. What about that gender dividend? What about the fact that compared to the global average, many countries in the Middle East, and certainly Iran, do not have as much female participation in the economy? Well, the science of, of economics, for those who believe it's a science, says that we, have, um, already in a, we are already in a situation where if we invest in bringing women into the economy, this is the case for European economies, you will see 
uh, between 5 and 10% growth in the economy. Everybody benefits. And that's before you get to issues like um, the workforce uh, balance. Studies showing that clients uh, are retained better. Workforce is more uh, comfortable and at ease if there's a between a 50, uh, if there's more like a 50-50 uh, participation. Is this something that can be, uh, can be attractive to you as businessmen? Number seven, energy efficiency. <sighs> Let's look at healthcare. Let's look at energy, let's look at education, let's look at transport, let's look at sanitation. These are things that governments around the world are investing in, wise governments are investing in more heavily, in a more intelligent way, in a way that's decarbonizing. Uh, President Rouhani, one of his main things is decarbonize, green economy, decarbonize. Digital uh, systems, decentralized systems, the, the virtual power plant concept, all of these things are good business propositions. Last one, number 11, safe, habitable cities. By the year 2025, it's estimated that 60% of people on this planet will be living in cities. So let's look at the same set of, 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 of points. Sanitation, healthcare, education, energy, and transport. Are these things that governments and private sector wish to invest in sensibly and harvest the benefits? If that's the case, shouldn't private sector be now aligning its, its corporate decision making with the SDGs? Before coming here today, last night, in fact, I read something by CSR Europe. And I know that many of you, at least certainly the, the European businessmen in here, will be familiar with CSR Europe. They're saying that 90% of businessmen serve and women surveyed in, in, in work that they've done recently agree that they should align their um, their business decisions with the SDGs. Because the SDGs, frankly, for this planet at this time, it's our only plan. And believe me, again, third time I'm referring to this. Being in the UN for 30 years, I've seen plans come and go. This is, this is the best one I've seen. Frankly, where we stand right now, for all the reasons I've mentioned, both the resource crunch and the apocalyptic uh, reasons, I believe that uh, this is something that we should do. Therefore, Corporate social responsibility, yes, come um, bring your investment for mining companies, for other companies, spend some of that in rehabilitating um, the environment. We have water problems, deforestation, uh, biodiversity loss, all of these problems we have in Iran. Yes, but, but, but see also for yourself in investing much more, more powerfully in these goals a future. And if we get it right, we may well see that this future is actually something that our children and grandchildren will look back on us, this generation right now, and be proud for having helped sustain. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Immediately there was a question for you, Gary. Okay, do you want to, shall we take a few or just one? Okay, let me just get that in case he starts. Thank you very much for the very impressive uh, presentation, Mr. Lewis. Uh, I'm Giulio Terzi. Uh, I am advisor to an organization which is WANI, an American European organization. Um, very impressed by uh, a specific reference you made, uh, uh, according to a, an opinion poll that you mentioned, that environment, uh, environment has to be considered uh, of an importance of importance at a higher level than business, in a way. The, the, there was a, 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 an opinion poll that you said 60% of people who have been polled answered that environment has to be taken into account when doing business and, and, and in a way, be given a preference in, in, in the business decisions, a, at least to a certain point, obviously. My question is, uh, direct, straightforward, what about human rights? Uh, what is your assessment of the human rights situation under Rouhani presidency? Thank you. Okay, many thanks. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, yes, gentleman there and gentleman here. Okay. So, uh, the gentleman there at the back putting his hand up.
There we are. And then there's another gentleman here who will also get a microphone at some point. Okay, maybe you have more than one mic. I think we are. Uh, okay, let's we'll take it as it comes. Yeah. Yes, sir. Do you want to have the pleasure to respond to the human rights question first? No, I'd, uh, I'd okay. like to take as many questions as I possibly can yeah. and try to remember them. Thank you for your very passionate plea for the SDGs. Could you tell us uh, who you are, sir? Yes, I will. Uh, Joel Pashu, I work for the Iran Responsibility Business Project. Uh, and uh, I left the UN after 15 years. I didn't have your courage. But um, my question is, you, you presented corporate responsibility and the involvement of business uh, mostly as an add-on. You make millions, give a few to whatever goal that there is. At the same time, we have seen in Europe, particularly, corporate responsibility turn into a strategic option for companies to manage risk. And we see regulatory pressure in France, for instance, in the UK with the Slavery Act, uh, and so on and so forth. So uh, the first part of the question is, don't you think it's a bit dangerous to present corporate responsibility as a philanthropic or optional activity when it's about managing risk and negative impact on the environment or on people? And the second question is, uh, what could you do as the UN to help business to act responsibly, by which I mean to align their core business and not extra business with the SDGs? Thank okay. you. Okay, and the gentleman here. Hi. Thank you very much. A for great the voice. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Sam Tamiv, Abaco Global Resources. A uh, bit of an extension to that question. Uh, on a practical level, does the UN actually help? Uh, implement these sustainability policies that you laid out? Okay, uh, thanks. Let me take them in reverse order. Um, the answer is yes, we do. In fact, what I just did is part of that, which is to advocate for people. I should have started the, the, uh, the exchange by asking for a show of hands as to how many people in the room um, uh, have heard of the Sustainable Development Goals. And uh, I can do that now. How many people, now that, before, you, before I just talked about <laughs> them. <laughs> so a show of hands, how many people have heard of the SDGs? Okay, so about four, maybe about 65, 70%. That's encouraging. By the way, I gave um, a di completely different uh, presentation in um, the, the, the can one of the, uh, the, the Mahak Charity Cancer uh, Societies in Iran recently in Tehran, North northeast of Tehran, and um, I was really impressed at, uh, uh, at the same amount, about 70% had heard, because I then asked them questions about it, and they, they responded. Not that I'm going to do that today. Um, but, uh, so yes, we do. Um, the, the work that we mainly do is to advocate for those, where have they gone, um, uh, those goals, and work with government to, 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 to press the importance of, of, of basically indigenizing them, of localizing those SDGs, meaning um, in planning, in budgeting, in sub-national levels. In Colombia and Mexico, those countries have actually indigenized the SDGs down to the local level. It's amazing. Uh, also, issue of advocacy, um, connecting to private sector, and data. How do you know if we have achieved the goals if we don't have a baseline and an end line? And that's one of the biggest challenges we have right now. Uh, in all countries of this planet, and we see it too in Iran, where the uh, Central Statistical Institute um, is still trying to figure out what numbers and they're going to use and where they're going to come from to establish that baseline for, uh, for measuring. Because we've got between 2015 and 2030 to be able to show we've made some progress on all 17 of those goals. How are we going to do that? So that's a, that's a big issue. So that's something also the United Nations is, is working on. So we, we, we work with the governments and now... Um, in this type of way, we try to engage with the business community to try to persuade business women and men that these things are about survival. I, I believe that very pa passionately. I've been to some, I've, I've been to some amazing uh, places in the, uh, the world that, that, we, that we inhabit, and I've been utterly devastated by some of the things that I've seen. We cannot continue 
to abuse our planet in this way, folks. And therefore, uh, if, if even 10% of you today leave this room and go and search for more information on the SDGs and what you can do to, uh, uh, to, to support them through your own self-interest, the profit motive, I will have considered this a great success. I'll never know, but maybe our grandchildren and children will uh, benefit from that. Your question, sir, on... Um, I mean, businesses, what can we do? Um, I think, to some extent, I, 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 I tried to cover uh, that an the answer to that question in, the question, in, in answering this gentleman's uh, question. There is um, what the, the United Nations um, advocates for uh, corporate social responsibility, which is somewhat different from the pure profit motive, um, is to encourage um, a, a focus on, on the environment, in focus, uh, focus uh, on anti-corruption, uh, focus on human rights, and focus on labor practices so that when uh, a business operates in a specific country, uh, it, it delivers, it sees as part of its responsibility the need to deliver on, on, those, um, on those goals. And I see that a number of the principles that are used in European businesses can be considered uh, by other countries when those principles are are brought into the, the, the national setting. I, I was privileged to speak here last year, so this is my second uh, time speaking. And last year I emphasized heavily the importance of corporate social responsibility, but not so much as, as charity or goodwill or as a luxury item on the company's agenda, but as a very sensible, sound, strategic option. Perceptions matter in this, in this day and age. The optics matter. Um, a company can be humbled by exposure to having human trafficking in its supply chain. We've seen that before. So being a corporate, a, a responsible corporate citizen um, is, is pretty important. Human rights. Have a think about being the United Nations resident coordinator in a country where the question of human rights always crops up. And ask yourself the question, what would you say if you were here speaking to you about that issue? I can assure you that there are challenges on human rights in Iran. This is something that we, we know. Speaking with the authorities in Iran, they will tell you, let's talk about human rights. Let's talk about different aspects of human rights. And a very interesting conversation can evolve. I am a, a serving staff member of the United Nations, and one of my mandates is to elevate the issue of human rights. And I can assure you, you can go and check on the, uh, the, the website, all my speeches, where I mention human rights, and where I mentioned gender empowerment and gender equality too, so throwing that into the hat. You didn't ask about that. It's an aspect of human rights, but this is something that I do on a regular basis. We have right now four European ambassadors in this room, and I know that they stay very close to what I do on social media, and I have no doubt, you may ask them now, you may ask them afterwards, um, if there is any veracity to what I've just said. The point is, there are challenges. The point is, there are many who recognize that these things um, need to be addressed. There are some of us, myself included, who have run afoul of um, certain quarters, not all, uh, not even the majority, but certain quarters in Iran by raising the issue of human rights. <coughs> Just about a year ago, um, there appeared on national television a a show where uh, about two, three minutes was devoted by, the, um, by some uh, members of that broadcasting organization to challenging whether I should be in the country or not. Should I be allowed to stay? Was I pushing 
the envelope too far? Was I crossing red lines? So in asking me, what about human rights? You have uh, a cornucopia of things which I could say in response. But I hope that by responding in the way that I have, first by asking you what you would say, and then by explaining that I try to um, enter into a dialogue and a discourse that elevates that issue, uh, informs it, and maybe results in some, some positive outcomes, which I will not go into at this stage. I hope that that uh, indicates that there are possibilities for the expansion of reasoned discussion on these issues. Um, in a context where much of the narrative is theologically driven, and as you know, I am assuming uh, that I can profile the country that you're from, um, discussing issues of theology often um, is, is counterproductive to, to solving a problem. And, uh, but nonetheless, it's been done, and I hope that I have not only made a contribution in the four and a half years that I've been there, but I've also, as carefully but as critically as I can, answered your question.